Yeah, now we're going to go up to floor three. All right. Fo floor three is the middle <laughs> and is the most important part. This is the attention mechanism, and that is the the heart of the transformer. That's like what's most revolutionary about this model and that really enables a lot of uh, what we're seeing, a lot of this text generation. Like if you think back to LSTMs and when uh, they were generating text, like it, a lot of the time was nonsensical. There was no um, like uh, coherency to it, cohesion. Um, <laughs> I can always get confused between the two. Um, whereas transformers, it's pretty like, well, a lot of the time indistinguishable from human te uh, text and uh, the main reason for this is this attention mechanism. So we're going to talk about the attention me mechanism and before we do, I'll give another example. So let's think about this sentence. The dog did not cross the street because it was too tired, right? You know this one, John? No, actually. Okay, so the dog did not cross the street because it was too tired. Which uh, word, what does the word it mean? Which noun does it refer to in this sentence? Right, right, right. Uh, the dog, of course. The dog, obviously, because the dog it was too tired. But now let's change one little thing, one word about the sentence at the very end. The dog did not cross the street because it was too wide. Which mm. word does the word it mean now? What does the word it nice. mean? Nice. Now? now it's the street. That was a great it's example. It's the street. Right. Nice. Right. This is actually from one of the uh, TensorFlow or Google libraries uh, visualizing transformers. And they use, I think, the animal did not cross the street because it was too wide, too tired or too wide. So by changing one word at the very end of the sentence, all after those nouns, after the word in question, the word it, by changing one word, we can change the meaning of a preceding word, of the word it in this case. So in one case, it means dog. In one case, when it's too tired. In one case, it means street, when it's too wide. And that shows us that there's not just semantic meaning behind words. There's also contextual meaning. There's lots of types of meaning. You know, they can be sarcastic meaning. They can be emotional meaning. There's lots of different meanings in linguistics. But the two main ones that we're focusing about here is uh, semantic meaning. We already have that in our vector embeddings. But now there's a new kind of meaning that we don't have captured in our vectors, and that is contextual meaning. And that depends on the words around the word. It depends on the whole sentence or the whole paragraph or the whole text that we're processing. Um, so contextual meaning is also important and it can alter the meaning of the word that we're looking at. And so the, the goal of that tension mechanism is to capture, to create new vectors. So we have vectors that embed semantic meaning that then have positional coding. Now we want to enhance them even further and create vectors that can contain contextual meaning. And that's what the attention mechanism addresses. I'm going to go through um, how the attention mechanism works. It's going to be a bit more technical than everything else we've had so far in the podcast. It'll be the most technical part of this podcast, uh, of this episode. I'll do my best to simplify it as, as much as I can. But if you find it a bit too technical, maybe skip it, skip forward a bit and come back to it when you're in front of a computer and you can open up... Uh, the attention you need research paper, or, you know, again, you can always come to our course where we dive into these things over 30 tutorials. But let's do our best to dive into it. We're going to be talking about performing operations with vectors. And there's three ways to think about it. The most mathematically correct way is to think about them as linear matrix operations, right? So you have a vector, you apply a linear matrix operation to it, uh, and then you get uh, and a resulting vector. So when we say we want to create uh, a vector from this vector, that means we're just applying a matrix operation. Uh, second way to think about it is neural, um, neural like neural network uh, mentality or approach. Is you think of a vector as an as an input layer into a fully or an input um, series of nodes. Let's say 512 nodes, and that's the input to a fully connected layer. And the output is you know if you want a 512 dimensional vector. Is 512 nodes. You want a bigger, or smaller vector, less, more nodes, and basically each one. So both layers are fully interconnected, and there is no activation function. That's basically a how we modify or make create a new vector from an old vector. If you think about it from a neural network's perspective, and the final way is the most simplistic way to think about it is if you're not um, very good with matrix operations, if you're not good with neural networks, you just want to visualize it somehow. It's like a matrix, a, a vector has 512 uh, features. So you want to create a new vector also, let's say with 512 features. Well, the first feature of the new vector will be a weighted sum of the, all of the features of the original vector. The second 
uh, feature of the new vector will be a weighted sum of all the features of the original vector, and so on. So it's always a weighted sum. The weights are obviously random and different, and they are adjusted through training through a process called uh, backpropagation. And the neural network will learn, or transformer will learn, how to improve those weights. Whether you think about it as a matrix operation, a fully connected layer, or the simplistic approach, uh, these weights will be adjusted so that the transformer can perform the task we want it to perform in the most correct way, in the desired way. Okay, so that's a caveat about uh, uh, vectors. And so let's dive into this uh, attention mechanism. The way it works is uh, we have these vectors. Um, so let's say we're looking, we're going to look at a, sen uh, a sentence, apples are a type of delicious blank, right? So we want to predict the next word. So we have six words, apples are a type of delicious, and we want to predict the seventh word, which <laughs> it's probably going to be fruit, right? But it's a blank at the moment. Uh, we want to predict what that is, and in order to do that prediction, we're going to enrich our vectors with cont contextual meaning. So we're going to look, as an example, this is done, this, uh, this process I'm going to describe is done for each one of the words, each one of the six words that we have, uh, the attention mechanism is going to be applied. But we're going to look at just one word, just to keep it simple, and we're just going to pick one word as an example, uh, and then just assume that the same thing happens for the rest of the words. So for each one of these words, we, uh, from the original vectors that we had, uh, well, the vectors with the embedded vectors with the positional coding, we're going to create three new vectors for each word. There's going to be a Q vector called the query vector, a K vector called the key vector, and a V vector called the value vector. So Q, K, and V. So we'll have a QKV vector for the word apples, QKV vector for the word R, and so on, the QKV vector for the word delicious. Now, the Q vector, uh, and they're all created whichever way you want to think about it, whether it's a matrix operation or a neural network, simple way that we just described, those three ways. Like one, think, pick one of those and just think of it. That, that's how they create. So there's basically a matrix of weights for creating Q vectors in this attention mechanism. There's a matrix of weights for creating Q vectors, a matrix of weights for creating uh, the K vectors, and a matrix of weights for creating the V vectors. Three separate matrices that all need to be learned through training. Now, the Q vector is a vector which is saying what this word wants to uh, what this word is interested in. So the word delicious has its Q vector. And the Q vector of the word delicious is, Im, Im, is like is a manifestation of what this word delicious wants to attend to. When this mechanism, uh, attention mechanism is, is uh, trained and it's up and running, the word delicious will be looking through the rest of the words in the sentence and it'll be using its Q vector to communicate. I want to, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for this concept. Do you have this concept? Mm -hmm. Do you have this concept? Do you have this concept? So on floor one, <clears throat> when we had the word delicious, yeah, that word, the word delicious, delicious just has a location in our vector space. Yes, and that that word delicious is the same no matter what. Like its mm -hmm. its meaning is is the same. It's root to that. But by the time we get to floor three here, and we have this attention mechanism, these these Q, K, and V vectors, that word delicious that you're referring to. You're not referring to that in the abstract. You're talking about this a specific occurrence of delicious in a specific sentence. In a specific yes. yeah. And so good point. Yes. So in it has sentence. like way more, yeah, these Q, K, and V vectors reflect all of the extra context that that deliciousness has. So going back to the it thing that you were saying, these K, Q, and V vectors would allow us to be able to determine that it is referring to the dog or it is referring to the road. Whereas exactly. in level That's, one, it is just yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. So the Q vector for in that example, the Q vector for vector for the, the word it is going to be signaling or explaining to the rest, uh, is going to contain information about what that word it is looking for, right? So in one case, it'll be looking for uh, an, an animal or like a, a, a living noun or like an actor. Uh, in another case, you'll be looking something, an obstacle, a street, or something like that. Like, it's really, it, it's obviously not going to be um, humanly intelligible because this is all going to be trained through backpropagation and lots and lots of uh, iterations in many epochs. But, like, you can think about it that way. There's something, like, each word needs needs some information about the context of the sentence that we're specifically talking about in order to be to then become context-enriched. 
And in our example, apples are a type of delicious blank. The word delicious is looking for certain things. And what it's looking for is going to be, we want the transformer to put that into the Q vector. So that's the Q vector for delicious. Next, every word, as we discussed, every word will have the K vectors. Now we're going to talk uh, the Q, Q, K, and all three vectors. Now the K vector, right? So the K vector is like an indexing mechanism. It tells us what the vector contains. So the V vector will have the value, so the thing of interest. So each word will have something of interest that it can give to other words for their context, and that is stored in the vector V. Whereas the K vector is going to be communicating what is stored in this V vector. So um, each word will have a K vector, like the word apples will have a K vector. Uh, the word R will have a K vector. A will have a K vector. Type will have a K. Oh, each one of them will have its own K vector. Uh, and now what's going to happen is we're going to compare. Remember, we're doing this attention. We're doing this for the word delicious. So the Q vector of the word delicious is going to be compared, and I'll explain what that means in a second. It'll be compared to each one of the K vectors of all of the words in the sentence, including itself. So the Q vector for delicious so I, let's say I'm the word delicious. I'm looking for certain information. And that what I'm looking for is described in the Q vector. Now I'm going to go take that Q vector, or the transform is going to take that Q vector, and it's going to compare it to the K vector of the word apples. If those vectors are aligned, that means apples has what I'm looking for, and I need to take the V value from apples and include it in my context. If those vectors are not aligned, then apples is completely irrelevant to what I'm looking for, and I should disregard whatever apples has in the word in the v vector. Then I'm going to go to the next word, r. You know, r is a plural verb. Maybe it has some meaning that's relevant that's to the word q uh, to the word delicious that it's looking for. So the q vector for the word delicious is going to be compared to the word uh, to the k vector for the word r. If they are aligned, then yes, that the value inside the v vector of the word r is um, important for the context of the word delicious and should be taken into account. If they're not aligned, it should be disregarded. That value is not important to the context. And that keeps that process keeps happening, including with itself. So the Q vector for delicious will be compared to the K vector for delicious if they are aligned. That means whatever value is inside the V vector for delicious is important to the context of the word delicious. If they're not aligned, that means it's, uh, it's not important. It should be disregarded. So that's how QK and we work. We'll talk about the mathematics of how this this actually is implemented just now. But I just wanted to check, uh, like, how did how did that sound, John? Yeah, pretty good. For I think it's about as well as you could without visuals, like you say. It's uh, it's kind of it's a little bit tricky to keep all these things straight. But I mean, fundamentally, for any given term, any given word in a sentence, so like your sentence, apples are a type of delicious blank. Um, yeah, in each, at each of those words, we've got the Q vector, the K vector, the V vector, um, and together that information allows us to map positions and context together to, um, to yeah, to effectively attend to these words and, and, and understand them in context and allow us to predict what a good final word is at the end of the sentence, apples are a type of delicious blank. Yep, yeah, exactly. And so that is achieved, uh, the word of interest, in our case, delicious, you take the Q vector, and then for each other word in the sentence, including itself, you look at the K vectors and the V vectors. So you compare Q and K, and if they are aligned, then you take the V vector as part of your context. If they're not aligned, you don't. So how is this achieved mathematically? Well. Uh, the Q, it's quite an elegant, straightforward solution. You take the dot product of the Q vector for the word delicious and, and the K vector of whatever other word you're looking at. So let's say delicious and apples, right? So you take the Q vector of delicious, you take the K vector of apples, and you calculate the dot product. In case you need a refresher, dot product is basically the multiplication. You, multi you take the absolute value of each one of these vectors, you multiply those two, absolute values, and then you multiply it by the cosine between those two vectors. If two vectors are perpendicular, then uh, their cosine is going to be zero, and so their dot product is going to be zero. And uh, if they are aligned, if they're pointing in somewhat the same direction, then their dot product is going to be 
non-zero, and the more they're aligned, the more they're pointing in the same direction, the more, the higher their dot product will be. So that kind of reflects the, the logic that we just described of how we want um, uh, you know, the alignment of vectors. And the interesting thing is that we're operating in a 512 dimensional space. And in a 512 dimensional space, two vectors are always going to be perpendicular unless they share a projection into at least one of the dimensions. But because there's so many dimensions, the chances are that most vectors are going to be perpendicular. And so that allows our transformer, that gives our transformer a lot of room for maneuvering to keep a lot of vectors as zero during, like, during as a result of the training. A lot of the dot products are going to be zero, except for the ones that really matter. So in the case of delicious, you know, we want in the in the for the word delicious, we want as much context as possible because we're going to be predicting the next word. So obviously we need something from the word apples because you know, if we had, I don't know, like cucumbers instead of apples, then it would be cucumbers are a type of delicious vegetable, not fruit. So obviously we need context about apples in there. So that vector, that dot product has to be non-zero. And the transformer will have to learn that over training to set up the matrices. Remember we talked about the Q matrix, the V, the K matrix, and the V matrix? It will have to learn to set up those matrices in such a way that in this particular sentence, the dot product of the Q vector for delicious and the K vector for apples is going to be non-zero so that then we can extract the context from the word apples for the word delicious. So the dot products are going to be calculated in, in, the, in that way for each one of these combinations, the Q of delicious and then the K of each one of those words. So and as a result, we're going to have six different dot products. Some of them are going to be very low, close to zero or zero. Some of them are going to be high. For example, like in the case of apples, it should be quite high. Um, now we have these dot products. What we're going to do next is we're going to put them through a softmax function. Uh, just as a quick refresher, softmax effectively takes the exponent of a value and then divides by the sum of the exponents of all of these six values in this case. So basically, it will give us a probability distribution. And we'll have these six elements in this probability distribution. So for example, in the case of apples, it might be like 80% are... Um, like maybe 5% A type of maybe like 0%, whatever. Uh, so we get these probability distribution, uh, these and we'll use them as weights. And we'll use them as weights for the V vectors of the associated words. So for example, in the case of apples, if the dot product of apples and delicious vectors, and then the softmax after it's applied, if, the, if that results in like 80% or like a 0 0.8, then we're going to take that as the weight of the vector V. Uh, for Apple. So basically, we're going to take a, a weighted sum of the V vectors, and the weighting is going to be this, the softmax of the dot products of the Q uh, for the word in question, delicious, and the K of each vector. So those will be our weights, what we get from the softmax, and we're going to be taking a weighted sum of the V vectors. Because the V vectors, as we discussed, they contain what that word is bringing to the table, like what that word is offering to other words as context. Right? So, so in the case of delicious, we want the context from apples. We don't care about the context from A, R, A, of. We care about the context from type. And all of that will come as a result of, basically, it will be, um, it will be sh evident in the transformer after the training, after lots and lots of training, which we'll talk about later on. We'll talk about training. After lots and lots of training, we'll get a result where this uh, contextual vector that we're creating as a weighted sum for the word delicious, it will have the right context from the right words that matter in this sentence. Um, and yeah, and that's a, a weighted sum of these V vectors. As you can see, it's a, it's a very elegant solution, very elegant mathematical solution to the logical problem that we had at the start.